Dead faces in the water. Dead faces everywhere. Chapter Eight, The Shire. Summary. Simple folk, free from care and fear. Bilbo Baggins is sitting in his garden, smoking his pipe. The sun is warm and bright, and he has his eyes closed, basking in it. It is a good day in the Shire, and he is glad to be there. Oh, sometimes his bones itch for an adventure still. Yes, but Bilbo is an old hobbit now, and his traveling days are far behind him. He is happy to be just where he is, in his own comfortable hole in the ground, with his pipe in his hand, and a book in his lap. The moan, when it comes, seems like something out of a dream more than a memory, but it jolts a memory loose nonetheless. A memory of a hissing voice telling riddles in the dark. The garden is cold now, suddenly. Cold and gray, as though a great cloud has passed overhead and blotted out the blaze of the sun. Bilbo sits up with a start and looks around, his heart pounding. That is what saves him. He is already looking, already pushing himself to his feet, when the gangly gray thing comes lurching up out of the bright rhododendrons. Its hands are out, reaching, clawing for him. It seems to only have a few teeth, but all of them are sharp and bared at him as though in attack, or perhaps in hunger. But it is the eyes that Bilbo notices most of all, the huge, pale, luminous eyes. He gives a little cry and throws himself backwards, flinging up one arm in defense even as he falls from the chair. The thing is on him then, pawing at him. Its grip is soft but horribly strong, and Bilbo is on the ground now with no leverage and no weapon. It sinks its teeth into Bilbo's arm, and Bilbo shouts in fear more than pain. It hurts, it does, but at the moment he is far more concerned with the next bite and whether or not that one will kill him, and what he can possibly do to stop it before it can. His uninjured hand gropes at the empty grass for a weapon, a rock, a shield, the book, anything. He comes up with nothing more but soft dirt in his nails, and a mind-numbing terror that is making it very difficult to think. The thing has not stopped moaning. Even with its teeth tearing through the flesh of his arm, it is still moaning. Bilbo stares, transfixed at the bulbous lanterns of its eyes. They are so milky as to seem all but sightless, the pupils dull and fixed, the little pinpoints of black within the wide white expanse of its hungry stare. He knows those eyes. Oi, you! Get off him! Suddenly there are hands reaching out not for Bilbo, but for the filthy gray creature. It is hurled away, and a chunk of Bilbo's flesh goes with it. The moan becomes a snarl. Bilbo watches in numb shock as Frodo, dear Frodo, his nephew, close as a son to him, of course it would be Frodo who saves him, and Frodo's young friend, Samwise Gamgee, together wrestle the thing away from him. There is blood all down its gaunt face, and it snaps at them both, writhing like a breathless fish in their hold. Careful, Bilbo manages to gasp. Oh, do be careful. The terrible, hungry thing tears itself free and staggers off balance for one breathless moment before it turns and rounds on Frodo with another moan. Frodo stumbles backwards, his eyes gone wide with fear, and Bilbo feels as though his heart is about to stop. Not Frodo! he thinks. Oh, not Frodo, no! But he cannot do anything. 
cannot even catch his breath enough to get to his feet. He sits there, bleeding helpless with shock and terror, as Samwise grabs a rake off the ground and swings it around with a great cry. The heavy metal tines slam into the creature's head, and it goes sprawling down hard against the stony ground of the garden path. Sam! Frodo cries. Frodo! Sam shouts back. Are you all right, Frodo? Yes, Sam, yes, I'm fine! Frodo skitters sideways around the creature so that he can grab Sam's arm, both of them now shielded behind the rake that Sam is still brandishing. But there is no need for that. The creature is on the ground, and it is not getting up again. It twitches, twice, all over its body, its head lolling and jerking a little on its spindly neck. Then it goes still, rocking sideways so that one great milky eye can be seen, staring forever out at nothing. There are three heavy dents in its head from where the rake struck it, but Bilbo does not believe that was what killed it. It was the weight of the rake knocking its head sideways hard enough to snap its scrawny neck that finally ended the malice and the hunger in those wide, pale eyes. A quick death, at least. Better than what it wanted to give Bilbo, anyways, both here and, well, and then, too. Bilbo swallows, staring at the body. I think it's dead, Sam. Frodo says, his voice quite small and his eyes extremely large. What? Sam gapes. No, no, it... No, what? Bilbo lurches to his feet at last. He is bleeding, and that is bad. Some distant part of his brain that is still functional despite everything, despite that, remembers that much. He gropes absently in his pocket and comes out with a handkerchief. A bit archaic, Bilbo knows, to carry those around still. But he has been the local eccentric for years now, and he is expected to engage in small oddities. Anyway, no one never knows when one will need a handkerchief. Case in point, his bleeding, bitten arm. Bilbo wraps the handkerchief around the wound and squeezes tight to slow the blood. It is strange how little it hurts. He suspects that that is shock, and any moment now his mind will wake up enough for the wound to start screaming at him. But, well, that hasn't happened yet. So he grips his bloody arm and stares at the dead thing in front of him, and tries to catch his breath. It is hard, with the weight of old memories and fresh terror both bearing down on him. Frodo is suddenly beside him arms there to catch him when he wobbles. Bilbo, he cries. Bilbo, are you all right? Yes, yes, lad, I'm fine, Bilbo answers without really thinking about it, without meaning it. He cannot take his eyes away from the corpse that lies sprawled across the paving stones of his pretty garden path. It is such a strange thing to see the creature there like that. It feels as though something out of another world, another life, has suddenly crashed into the Shire, and nothing will ever be the same. Sam is still holding the rake, but it is no longer brandished in defense. Now it hangs heavy from his hands, and he is staring at the dull, rusty stain of blood upon the tines in growing horror. He's in shock, too, Bilbo thinks, in a distant sort of way. Someone will have to deal with that before it gets out of hand. Someone will have to be Frodo, because Bilbo cannot focus on Sam right now. All of his attention is fixed on the body in front of him. It is still, still as the grave, but Bilbo is shaking anyway. There is a word in his throat, trying to climb out. It is an old word, an ugly word. 
it makes Bilbo shudder to think of it. But it is coming none the less. It must be spoken. He cannot stop it. Gollum! he cries, staring at the shriveled grey corpse. Gollum! Frodo gives his uncle a sharp, curious look. Bilbo is holding his handkerchief to his wrist with fingers so tight the knuckles have gone white as bone, but he barely seems to notice the bloody wound. All his attention is fixed on the dead thing in front of him. Can it be? He murmurs, seemingly more to himself than to his nephew. Merciful stars! I thought the fellow was long dead. Oh, he is certainly dead now, and no mistake, Sam says gruffly, scowling hard at the corpse in a transparent effort to resist the urge to cry. He sniffles anyway. I didn't think I hit him that hard. Sam's misery shakes Bilbo from the stupor that the sight of the golem creature cast over him, and he musters a smile from somewhere. Oh, Samwise, don't carry on so, Bilbo says, feigning cheer with desperate enthusiasm. It was clearly self-defense, or defense of me at least, and that's a very good reason to do just about anything in my book. Self-defense and an accident to boot, and I've the bloody bite to prove it. He brandishes his injured arm and even manages a laugh, although it comes out forced and shaky. I suppose, Sam says with a heavy sigh. He tosses the rake aside with a glower of disgust for the improvised weapon. I just... I, I didn't mean to, is all. It's all right, Sam. Frodo says, stepping away from Bilbo so that he can lay a hand on Sam's shoulder and give it a reassuring squeeze. Of course you didn't mean to. Everyone in Hobbiton knows you haven't got a violent bone in your whole body, and no one can blame you for defending Uncle Bilbo. I'd have hit him myself if you hadn't got into the rake faster. It was Frodo that Gollum had gone after when Sam hit him, in fact, but neither Baggins seems to think that is a distinction worth mentioning at the moment. Personally, Bilbo declares, I'm more inclined to classify the deed as putting the poor fellow out of his misery more than anything else. A Gollum was never what you'd call a happy thing, from what I know of him. And the years since we crossed paths certainly doesn't seem to have done him any kindness. He looks like he was more than half dead before he even entered the Shire. So you do know him then, Frodo says. It seemed as though you did. Well, we were hardly on friendly terms, Bilbo exclaims. But we did meet once, yes, many years ago. I can't say it was a pleasant interaction for either of us, but I'm not sure it quite merits his trying to tear my throat out with his teeth. Regardless, I'll tell you the story if you like, lads. Frodo and Sam shared a smile at that. The familiarity of Bilbo offering to tell a tell from the wild youth that cemented his eccentric reputation seems to snap the spell of terror that Gollum's attack cast over the day. Their racing hearts begin to slow, and the sun seems to come back out from behind its cloud. It is a terrible thing that this strange creature is dead, but Bilbo is alive and only hurt a little and that is a good thing to balance against the bad. In that moment, it truly seems that everything will be all right. The world will go back to normal, and life in the Shire will go on as it ever has. Everything is going to be all right. I think a story is just what we need after this fright, Frodo says firmly. A story and some tea and a snack. But let's get your arm taken care of first thing, uncle. 
Then I suppose we'd better call the sheriffs, he adds with a frown. They'll need statements from all of us about this, and we'll have to figure out what to do with this poor Gollum once they're done with him. I suppose it's not really our responsibility, but, well, Frodo says quietly, I can't imagine he has any kin to look after him. And frightening as he looks, and frightened as I was to see him coming at me with all his teeth, I still can't help but pity him. That's right noble of you, Frodo, Sam says loyally, although the dismayed glance he casts at the dead thing by his feet seems less merciful than revolted. I'm sure the sheriffs will be glad to have somebody step up and... Well... And figure things out, with the funeral, and the burial and all. Well, someone has to do it, Frodo says, and tries to push them back up the path away from the corpse. Bury him good and deep, Bilbo murmurs, casting one last look back over his shoulder at the thing that was once called Gollum before he lets his nephew usher him into the house. Make sure he stays down there this time. Of course, uncle, says Frodo, and shoes everyone across the threshold so he can shut the door. Perhaps it is silly to lock it, when the worst thing out there is a pitiable corpse. But Frodo has had a terrible fright. He is allowed to be a bit silly if he wishes. He locks the door and hurries off to fetch bandages and disinfectant. He is sure that Gollum's mouth was absolutely filthy, and he doesn't want Bilbo to get some wretched infection from that bite. The sounds of Sam putting the kettle on for tea in the kitchen are comforting, and Frodo lets himself relax enough to smile. He is sure that the conversation with the sheriffs will be awkward for everyone but they'll get through it. It has been a wretched day, and there are more unpleasant things to come, he knows, but at least the worst of it is over with, and they're all going to be all right. Behind the hobbits, the corpse lies still in the sun. Bilbo's blood gleams red and wet on the paving stones. Eventually, something moans. Up next, a great house of healing. Dead faces in the water. Dead faces everywhere. Chapter 9 Rivendell Summary A Great House of Healing Author's Note Nestando is the Quinya Healer Physician, here used to indicate a doctor of both medicine and lore. Asarta is the Quinya Dr. Leech, here used to indicate a medical doctor. Excuse me, Nestando Elrond? Elrond looks up from the clipboard in his hand, blinking a little as he brings his mind to focus on the young woman standing in front of him instead of on proposed treatment plans for an ancient lingering wound. Yes, Asarta, he says politely. It takes him a moment to place her in his memory. It is not his distraction, nor even the white mask that covers the lower half of her face that delays his recollection of her name. It is the look in her eyes, a look he has never seen those eyes wear before. It is a look not merely of fear, 
but of a slowly gnawing horror. Elrond frowns. What is it, Isterin? Isterin is making a visible effort to project calm, so Elrond will not ask her what is wrong. Not yet. He will let the young doctor come to that in her own time. If you are not busy, Nistando, she takes a deep breath, bracing herself. Elrond silently notes that the hands on her clipboard are clenched very tight. Some of the patients who have come in over the last few days have been... strange. That is, she amends quickly, lest he call her out for unprofessionalism. The symptoms they present are strange. We can find no match for any disease in our records, and they are... She hesitates again. Elrond notes the puffiness of the skin under her eyes, the shadows lying there like smudges on her soul. In an elf, such a thing would be a sign of an advanced state of mental distress, or even fading, perhaps. But in a human, it signifies exhaustion. Restless sleep, mayhaps, lying up worrying or poring over texts in search of the one that has the answer, trying to do too many things in too few hours and sacrificing slumber in order to make time from nothing. Nightmares. Yes, Elrond prompts again, gently. They are troubling, Asterin says frankly. If you have time to consult on the case, your expertise would be welcome. If it is an illness of which the archives have no record, I do not think that I will have expertise to offer, Elrond cautions even as he steps forward to follow her. Still, I will do what I can. Another pair of eyes rarely goes amiss. Thank you. As Terran says, setting a brisk pace through the calm halls of Imladris University Teaching and Research Hospital, Elrond matches strides without comment. After a few minutes, Isterin starts speaking again. It seemed innocuous at first, she says. Nosebleeds, fevers, chills, nothing of great concern, although it was troubling that the symptoms did not resolve, either on their own, with time, or with any of the customary treatments for such ailments. It is viral, but none of our existing antiviral therapies seem to affect it. All we can do is treat the symptoms. We can bring the fevers down for a time and clot the blood for a time, but the symptoms just get worse. Disorientation follows, then delirium. Now some of the more advanced cases have even turned violent, attempting to harm anyone that comes near, whether caregiver or loved one. Her voice is low, hushed. She speaks like one who fears the words coming out of her own mouth, like someone who strives not to start a panic. That quiet, tense voice fills Elrond with a shiver of fear. Which types are being affected? he asks, matching her in volume, if not in dread. Isterin swallows. Elrond can see the bob of her throat against the high collar of her white robes. All of them, it seems, she murmurs. Elrond nearly stops walking mid-stride, he is so startled. By the same illness? With the same symptoms? Isterin shakes her head, a signal more of frustration than disagreement, it seems. Close enough to be concerning, she explains. At first, it seemed only a human ailment, and it was not so concerning to us then. My people are particularly susceptible to illness, as you know. Elrond nods, but does not interrupt. Then Disra from the geology department was brought in followed a day later by two other dwarves. The day after that, we had our first hobbit patient, and now we have five. And all suffering from nosebleeds and fevers, Elrond confirms. 
Isterin nods. And all but the most recent admissions from disorientation, too. The first patients admitted have all reached the violent stage. They are all humans, so perhaps that is a symptom specific to my people, but... Her voice trails away. She swallows again, and Elrond can see her shoulders rise as she draws a long, fortifying breath before she forces the next words out. But I was just in Disra's room, and she has become snappish and nonverbal. I have... I have had her restrained as a precaution. Elrond's eyes widen. I see he says, and he is careful to keep shock and censure alike from his voice. You have only mentioned humans, dwarves, and hobbit patients, he notes, yet you say all beings appear to be affected. Yes, Istrin draws another heavy breath, but this one does not seem to make her next words any easier to say. As of this morning, we have two elvish patients. Both are presenting only mild fevers so far, but we have placed them under observation as a precaution. Both, she adds softly, are asartar here. A chill like the hill Karakse runs down Elrond's spine. Let me see Disra first and then one of the humans whose symptoms are the most advanced, and then one of the hobbits. Then I would like to see our people. Of course, Isturin says. Elrond cannot see her mouth through the white mask that covers the lower half of her face, but he can see the way her shoulders sag with relief, can see the warmth that chases some of the shadows from her dark brown eyes. Her swift pace increases, leading the way to the isolation ward. As Elrond follows, he draws a mask of his own from one of the pockets of his robe. Whatever this illness is, if both humans and elves can catch it, then a pedophil almost certainly can as well. But it is less fear of contagion that prompts his donning of the protective gear than it is a desire to hide the grimness of his own face from Istirin's eyes. The relief that she has drawn from the promise of his presence may be misplaced, but that does not mean he wishes to destroy her hopes so early. Let her take a few moments of comfort in the thought that this is something he will be able to fix even if that comfort should soon prove false. Elrond has a feeling that they will all of them need as many moments of comfort as they can find in the days to come. No visions of foresight have unfurled before his eyes, but Elrond has lived a long time and survived through many perils. He does not need a vision to know the taste of impending disaster on the breeze. Coming up, a shadow in the valley, aka the plot begins at last. Dead faces in the water. Dead faces everywhere. Chapter 10 Rivendell Summary A Shadow in the Valley Summer sun is bright as it slants down into the valley, unhampered by the branches of the tall pines that ring its heights. A strange peace hangs in the air over Rivendell, as though none of the strife that troubles the rest of the world is permitted to set foot in this tranquil valley. 
None of the pain, none of the suffering, none of the shadows, not even those cast by the twisting branches of tall, black trees. Legolas stands hesitantly on the edge of the steep path that leads down to the valley's heart and the town tucked within its sheltering arms. He is not sure that he trusts a place like this. He also has nowhere else to go. Mirkwood is behind him now, its leaves burning and its branches filled with the dead. He followed the old forest road to the high pass alone and has now come down to the narrow gorge of the Brunian River. Rivendell lies before him, the spires of its citadels of health and learning both standing tall and gleaming in the summer sun. They are not especially large buildings by the standards of Middle-earth's cities, but they are by far the largest that Legolas has ever seen, and he is staggered by the sight of them now, and by the sprawling town spread out around their feet. It is a small town, to be true, but it does not look that way to the eyes of an elf of Mirkwood, who has never seen any land but that of his own dark trees. More even than the height of the buildings, he is staggered by the calm that lies over the town of Rivendell. The noises that rise up from the valley's foot are small, peaceful things. Friendly greetings, snatches of song, arguments about academic theories, the laughter of children running unfettered and fearless through the sunny streets. Legolas draws a breath that shakes against his lips like a leaf in a gale and lets himself stare down at the peaceful, happy valley for another moment. His shadow stretches out before him, long and dark, against the winding path. Birds sing in the clear air. Somewhere, someone plucks the notes of an old song out of the strings of a harp. Legolas bows his head and starts down the path, and his shadow spreads before him. Getting low on gas, Gimli observes, more for the excuse of saying something than because it is something that needs to be said. Expect there'll be a fuel station or two in Rivendell, though, so shouldn't worry. The P network relays are not working here any better than the ones in Erebor, which makes Gimli think it must be a nationwide issue, and thus something they will doubtlessly have to wait on Gondor for a fix for. This irks him, but less than it would if he were still in Erebor, and listening to Don Rhi and Moen gripe about the White City's sluggish tech support. But the local network is still up and running, and the car's nafter chirped to life twenty miles back. That was a relief, for the road into Rivendell is not paved, and he has had to focus on the curves to keep from bouncing them off the edge and into the hedge of thick trees that line the rattling path on either side. You would think that for a place with the reputation they've got, they could stand to make the drive a little nicer. Gimli grumbles, not for the first time. His father grunts, the sound noncommittal, an acknowledgment that someone spoke without being in any way a contribution to anything that might be construed a conversation. Gimli sighs. It has been a long journey, and he is very ready for it to be over. He is nonetheless taken aback when said journey terminates some miles sooner than he expected. What in all the bones of the world? He grumbles, scowling at the large sign that precedes a fork in the path. He squints through the glare of the sun on the window shield while the engine idles. No combustion vehicles permitted beyond this point? He reads aloud. What are they playing at? Gimli scowls harder, but the sign's words do not change. 
He skims through the rest of the instructions and prohibitions listed in the looping elvish letters, then twists the wheel hard to the right as he hits the gas again, perhaps slightly harder than necessary. Ah, uh, damn elves, he swears, and glances at his father. Glowen is leaning against the window, his eyes closed and his chin lowered against his chest so that his beard obscures most of his face. As tired as Gimli is, he knows that the trip has left his father twice as weary. Anger kindles in his belly at the thought of Glawn being forced to walk the rest of the way into the valley on foot due to some obscure elvish prescript. Welcome to Rivendell, indeed, he mutters and guns the engine a little harder, jolting down the road to the exterior parking area. It is, of course, both wooded and unpaved. That much Gimli expected. He did not expect it to be so empty, but there are only three other vehicles scattered across the small lot. Two sturdy, blocky things of what must be local makes, for he does not recognize them, but they appear to be rugged off-road vehicles similar to his own Mahal Motors Mountaineer and one battered red pickup truck spattered generously with mud all along its sides. Gimli grumbles and parks two slots over from the truck. There is a sheltered waiting area with signs that list shuttle times, which seems an innocuous thing in this nearly abandoned lot. He wonders if it is an oddity of Elvis' salaciousness at work to force people from their vehicles in order to keep the noise and the stink of gasoline-powered engines out of their pristine valley, but then provide regular shuttle service to transport them instead. Or if he is merely here at an off time. Perhaps this lot is packed with commuters on busier days, Gimli thinks, and then realizes with a start that he has no idea what day of the week it is. When did they leave the Lonely Mountain? Was it a Monday? A Wednesday? And how long have they been driving? A week, perhaps? More? Less? How strange not to know. But the days of their journey have all blurred together in his mind, so that it seems at once to have taken no time at all, and yet to have lasted somehow four months. Gimli shakes his head, banishing the fancy, and growls at himself. He is not even in their valley yet, and already his brain is succumbing to elvish follies. Looks like we'll have to walk from here, da, Gimli announces. He does not want to embarrass his father by making Glawn admit that he was dozing, so he speaks loudly to be sure that his words will do the work of waking the older dwarf without a more overt intervention. Unless you'd rather wait for the shuttle, that might be best, Gimli continues quickly, wishing that he had thought more before speaking. His father is tired. Of course they should wait for the shuttle. We have a fair bit to carry, after all. Dwarves don't shirk from burdens, Glowen retorts. His voice is slurred still with sleep, but he shoves his door open with finality and clomps across the hard-packed earth. Gimli grimaces and follows him around the truck, hurrying to get in front so that he can sort through their baggage and make sure they only grab what they need. The samples and documentation for the doctors, a bag or two of clothes and sundries, combs and brushes for their beards, chargers for their phones. Once Gimli has his father settled, he can come back for the rest of their things on his own while Glowen gets some much-needed rest. Can you believe they won't let gasoline engines in their town? Gimli says, griping to fill time while he sorts through the haphazard effects that too many days of travel in tight quarters have had upon their bags. 
Sun and moon-powered vehicles only, of all the nonsense. Just when you think you've heard of all the prissy Elvis crap you can't imagine, the pointy-eared leaf munchers come out with some new bit of idiocy. Glon grunts, a far cry from the drawling sarcasm that such observations about the nonsensical way of elves usually merits from him. A Gimli hides another grimace in his own beard and resolves to put everything heavy in his own bag. If he could get away with it, he wouldn't give his father anything to carry at all. But he knows Glan will scold him and grab the heaviest bag out of outraged pride if he did. Gimli does not want to admit it even to himself, but he is worried about his father. Glan has barely spoken in hours, his mind clearly elsewhere. It is not just the discomfort of the journey that weighs on him, Gimli knows. Not just the short commons and scant sleep and long hours cramped into a tight space. Glan is worrying about the lonely mountains. Gimli would be too, except that he has been focusing all of his energy on worrying about his father, on keeping Glan's sinking spirits up instead magnifying his own cheer a hundred folds in hope of compensating for his father's misery. He does not think it has been working very well, but they are here now. Hopefully, Imladris Hospital will have answers for them, and they can both stop worrying for a while. Gimli shoulders a lumpy bag of samples and doctor's notes, and slings another that holds a few changes of clothes and small necessities over his other arm. The bag he offers to Glan holds nothing but a few shirts and some socks, and Gimli hopes that his father will not notice how light it is and object. Glan is leaning against the side of the mountaineer, his head low, he looks somehow more tired than ever. He does not reach to take the bag, and Gimli frowns, opening his mouth to offer to carry everything, or just to leave the third bag behind, because it holds nothing that they truly need right now. But before he can speak, he notices that his father is shaking. Duh, he says, trying and failing to keep a sudden spike of anxiety from coloring his voice. Are you all right? Glon jerks his head in a nod and waves clumsily for Gimli to proceed him. Gimli frowns. Maybe we should wait for the shuttle, he says, lowering the last bag back into the truck. His father does not seem to notice, his chin still lowered in exhaustion. But he does shake his head. No. Glon grunts. Wait here long enough already. Go on. Gimli sighs and does as he's told, although he makes a mental note to get his father some coffee, or better, a long nap, as soon as they get to Rivendell. Yes, it is important that they present the Imladris doctors with the details about the strange plague affecting the Lonely Mountain as quickly as possible, but Glan is so tired right now that he can barely force coherent syllables from his lips. Imladris won't be getting a lot of useful information out of him like that, no matter how urgent the need. All right, duh. Gimli says aloud, and leads the way to the sloping, narrow path down into the valley. He shifts the straps of his bag to sit higher on his shoulders, and tries not to be too obvious about it when he glances behind him to make sure his father is following. Glon does, but his pace is slow and stiff-legged. He groans a little with the effort, quietly. Gimli winces and walks as slowly as he dares, listening hard to the shuffling footsteps of his father behind him. Up next, Moans and Mourning. <laughs> 